Hey guys, it's Brittany and welcome back to my channel. This week we are switching it up again and we're going to do some wine and true crime. This week I wanted to switch up the format because I'm covering another case that I really feel like is important to really get the facts right and really concentrate on what we're talking about. And that is the case of Erica Green, also known as Precious Doe. So if you want to hear all about this case, stay tuned. All right, guys. Now, first of all, as always, I want to say cheers to y'all because y'all are the real MVPs around here. Y'all have been really helping me grow at a crazy pace and I really do appreciate it. Thank you for all of the engagement, all of the comments, all of the likes, all of the sharing of my content. I do appreciate that and it will never go unnoticed. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of my busy bees out there. Also, for those of you who are just finding my channel, first of all, welcome, have a seat, grab a glass of wine and stay a while because we're going to cover a case that is really important to our culture. So we're going to cover a case that was a really big case and it's very unusual for it to be such a big case in the African-American community. So I wanted to make sure to cover this, but also make sure that you subscribe. You don't want to miss any of the other things that I cover. I also do true crime and makeup. I do snapped and skincare. I do fragrance reviews and I also do hair. So make sure you are in tune and make sure you also hit that notification bell so that you get notified whenever I post new content. All right, y'all, let's hop into the story. Erica Green was born on May 15th of 1997, and she was born to a mother in prison in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And her mother was in prison at the time for committing larceny. Some say it was forgery, but she was in prison when she gave birth. She had been there for about five weeks. And Erica was one of five children. And at the time, while Erica's mother, Michelle, was still in prison, Erica was handed over to Michelle's grandmother's friend and her name was Betty Brown. And Betty Brown pretty much raised Erica the entire time that she was on this earth. And Betty Brown was always quoted as saying that Erica was the most independent child that she had ever met. Now y'all know that can be a good thing and a bad thing, but independence is important even at a young age. Now on April 4th of 2001, after Michelle had gotten out of prison, Michelle came around with her then boyfriend, Harold Johnson, and they came over to Betty's house and they wanted to take Erica along with them for a family reunion. Now, what they ended up doing, unfortunately, was taking that little girl away from Betty Brown, who was the only stable person in her life at the time. And they took her to Kansas City, Missouri, where they moved in with cousins and Betty Brown never saw that little girl ever again. Now, while in Kansas City, Michelle was supposed to be finding a job, getting herself on her feet, making a better life for her and her five children. But instead, she continued drug use once she got out of prison. Now, on April 28th of 2001, a man called into the police department and he called and he said his friend who was his elderly neighbor, he had wandered off a while ago and he never came home. So he wanted the police to come out and look for this elderly man. So police came out, they searched for the elderly man. He ended up being found and he was completely fine. So they took him back home and the search was called off. Now they have been searching in woods and all these different areas. So as they were walking out of the woods, police came across the body of a small child. Now, not only was this child deceased, but this child was missing their head. Of course, the police started to search and it took them three days to actually find this poor child's head, which was wrapped in a plastic bag and was found near the vicinity of where the body was actually discovered. Now, when the quick autopsy or examination of the body was done, 
The medical examiner determined that this was the body of a three to four year old little toddler girl. She had brown eyes and she had her hair in braids or cornrows at the time that she was deceased. The Emmy could tell that she had only been in the woods for about three or four days and decomposition hadn't really set in. So it was really still viable that they could identify this little girl quickly. They also were able to determine that where she was found was not where the crime took place and that it was simply just a dumping ground or a secondary crime scene to the events that occurred. But they could see that this little girl had been beaten violently and police had also found an ashtray near this little girl's body and it was clear that it was, if not the murder weapon, at least one of the murder weapons that were used to take this poor little girl's life. They did examine the actual ashtray itself, hoping to find some type of evidence, whether it be fingerprints, DNA, anything, but there was nothing viable on that ashtray whatsoever. So they had to turn to the community for help with moving the case forward and identifying this little girl. And the thought there was that it's a three-year-old girl or a four-year-old girl. Somebody has to be missing their daughter. Somebody will report that a toddler is missing in this community. So they thought that this was going to be solved really quickly, or at the very least, the little girl would be identified very quickly. That never happened. So they created sketches and these initial busts of what the girl looked like, and they pushed it and they put it out there in the media. They had flyers in the community. And this case had even gained national attention because it was a little three-year-old girl and nobody was coming forward to look for her. And at this point, she was given the name Precious Doe. But even with all of this work and media attention, still no one came forward looking for her. So with the push in the national media, even the local push, about $33,000 ended up being raised as reward money for anyone who would come forward with some information that would help to solve the case. But even when that was put out there, still nothing came forward after a while. So in December of 2001, a funeral was held, a memorial and funeral was held for Precious Doe. They still had no clue who she was. But in 2002, they exhumed her body to do a detailed autopsy on this little girl. They exhumed her again in 2003 to create a better bust of what she would look like to help put that out to the media along with some sketches. And why this didn't take place all up front in 2001 when she was found, I don't know, but at least it got done. It took them exhuming her twice, but at least it got done. Now there was a very vocal activist in this case and he was local to the community. His name was Alonzo Washington, but he was really pushing to help get as much information as you could about this case and to help solve Precious Doe's case. And he even was instrumental in helping to raise that $33,000 reward that was put out there. But he would put out an ad every single year on the anniversary that Precious Doe was found and he would put out an ad just asking anybody who had information to come forward. And he would place it in the local African-American community's newspaper because he knew if anybody knew it was our community. She came from our community. Somebody had to know who she belonged to. So on April 30th of 2005, four years later, Alonzo got a phone call from a man by the name of Thurman Johnson. And he said that he had information that was pertinent to the case of Precious Doe. So when this man called Alonzo with this tip, he immediately forwarded this man's information over to the homicide department. Now, what Thurman McIntosh had to say was heartbreaking. What he said was he believed that his grandson and his grandson's wife were responsible for the death of Precious Doe. And he believed that Precious Doe was actually the wife's daughter. 
Now, he said that when the story broke way back in 2001, he was immediately suspicious of his grandson, Harold Johnson, and his then girlfriend, Michelle Johnson, because he knew that Michelle had a little girl. He, she had five children, but she had a little girl. And this little girl had just mysteriously gone missing one day. So he had confronted his grandson and his girlfriend about this little girl when the news broke. And they eventually confessed that yes, that was their daughter and she died from an accident and there was nothing that they could do to save her. And that little girl's name was Erica Green. Thurman McIntosh held on to this secret for years. Why he didn't come forward before now, I will never understand, but he felt like he was getting old, he was getting up in age, and his days were coming to an end very soon. And he just couldn't go to his grave holding in this secret about this little girl. Thurman was actually able to provide police with a picture of what he thought was Erica Green. I think it ended up being actually one of Erica's cousins, but he was also able to give police some of Michelle's, who is Erica's mom, hair to test and compare to Precious Doe to see if this was actually Erica Green. Now also when they talked to Thurman, he had so many details about the case that were never released to the public that either only the killer would know or someone who knew and spoke to the killer about the crime would have known. So they knew that this was not a hoax, this was not a joke at all. So police immediately want to talk to Harold Johnson and Michelle Johnson. Now they are both already in custody, in jail for unrelated charges. And they both had obviously criminal backgrounds. Michelle had background in theft and forgery. And Harold had a background for assault with a deadly weapon and being in possession of a sawed off shotgun. So th these weren't your up and up parents by any means. Now, when they talked to Michelle, she pretty much immediately admitted that yes, Precious Doe was her daughter and that Harold Johnson killed her daughter and she helped him cover up the crime. And she begins to tell the story of what happened to little Erica Green. So Michelle was a prostitute at the time and Harold was actually one of her regular customers and they eventually started dating and got together that way. Michelle went on to say that one night when they were at home in April of 2001 in Kansas City, Missouri, it was her, Erica Green, and Harold Johnson at home. So Michelle said that she put Erica to bed and shortly after putting Erica to bed, she had come back into their bedroom and Erica was told, you know, go back to bed. It's past your bedtime. And she did. She listened to her mom and she went back to bed. So after that, Michelle decided that she was going to go in the bathroom and take a bath. Now, when Michelle came out of the bathroom, Harold had told her that Erica was being bad because she came out of the room again and he told her to go back to bed and she wouldn't listen to him. Now, at this point, Harold is drunk. He's also high on PCP, which we know causes delusions and erratic behavior. But he is very angry at this little toddler child because she kept getting in and out of her bed. So much so that he proceeded to kick this little girl in the head and then beat her with an ashtray. Now, when Michelle came out of that bathroom, she started screaming and panicking, screaming at Harold, what, what did you do? What did you do to my child? Once she did that, she saw Erica's eyes roll into the back of her head and her baby went limp. And in that moment, she was in survival mode, according to Michelle, and she took her daughter and she put cold water on her daughter to try to wake her back up, but nothing worked. So she ended up bringing her back into the bedroom and just putting her on the floor and they left her there. The medical examiner said, had they taken little Erica to the hospital, she would still be alive today. She would have survived. She would have been okay. She would have recovered, but they decided to leave that little girl on the floor for days, for days. 
And their reasoning behind not taking her into the hospital was because they both had warrants. And if they would have taken their child in, police would have found out where they were and they would have been arrested. So to cover their own butts, they decided that they were gonna let a little girl die on the bedroom floor instead by leaving her there for days. So they waited and they waited. And finally, she looked or appeared as if she had passed away. She stopped breathing, according to Michelle. Now, some reports actually say that little Erica was still alive when they took her out of that bedroom. But either way, she could have been saved if she was taken to the hospital. But what they did was once they thought she was passed, they put her in a stroller and they took her out into the wood. And that's where they dumped her. And then they went on about their life like nothing ever happened. And whenever someone asked about little Erica, where was she? They would just say, oh, she went permanently to live with Betty Brown. That's who has full custody of her now. She's not with us anymore. And that was that. So both Michelle and Harold were obviously arrested. Some of their children became wards of the state once they were arrested and some of them went to family members. Now let's talk about the trial. Now Harold Johnson, he pled not guilty to first degree murder. Now he was not denying that he was responsible for the death of Erica Green. What he was fighting was the fact that it was first degree murder, meaning that it was premeditated murder rather than a lesser murder charge. But a cousin came forward named Luanda Driscoll and she said that Harold would beat her all the time. He would beat Erica all the time. This was not a random out of anger thing. This was routine for him to do. Now on November 21st of 2008, he was found guilty of first degree murder in the case of Erica Green. And he was ultimately given life without the possibility of parole. Now, Michelle, she chose to take a plea deal. She did agree to testify against Harold as part of her plea deal, and she got 25 years in prison for her cooperation. But there's more. So at the time that Erica was born, while her mother was in prison, her biological father, Larry Green, was also in prison at the time. So that was the reason why baby Erica was given to Betty Brown to be cared for until her mother got out of prison. But in 2010, Erica's father, Larry, decided that he was going to sue the Department of Human Services and the Department of Corrections in Oklahoma for basically being negligent in who they gave the child to and what transpired after she was given to her mom who was fresh out of prison. Now he believes that Erica would have still been alive today if these agencies would have just cared about this little girl that they handed off to someone and didn't keep up with after that. It was documented with DHS that Michelle was not a fit mother for her other children. She had been under investigation in Oklahoma and at the very least, the Department of Corrections should have communicated with DHS about her having another child and making sure that there was a plan in place for the best, safest possible care for this new child. But that didn't happen. Instead, what happened was when Michelle got out of prison, she showed up at Betty Brown's door to retrieve her child and Betty Brown never saw this baby ever again. And then we know what events took place after that. Now, as I said before, Michelle had a long history of being a terrible parent. She also had a long history with drug abuse. And in Illinois in 1992, it was found that she failed to protect two of her children from child abuse. And then a year later, she gave birth to a child who tested positive for cocaine. And then in 1997, when all of this was taking place and Erica was born in prison, she was already under investigation by DHS in Oklahoma because she had given birth to a fourth child that tested positive for cocaine. 
The person who went to check on her, the social worker, basically documented that this woman was still using drugs while she was pregnant. So all of this was documented and these kids still slipped through the cracks. This baby still ended up with her drug addicted, negligent mother. How? So basically, Erica's father's goal was outside of monetary retribution. He wanted them to really change their policies on what they did with these children that were born while their parents were in custody. Now, of course, the Department of Corrections said, oh, our employees did exactly what they were supposed to do, nothing more, nothing less, and called the case frivolous. And then the DHS, on the other hand, basically said, oh, it's bad, but that's all on the Department of Corrections. We only step in when a baby is born and there is no one that comes forward and is able to care for this child. Because Betty Brown stepped forward, we didn't have anything to do with this. The other problem is it's extremely easy to get custody of these children. They said all Betty Brown had to do was fill out a one page form, show a form of ID and her Sam's Club card. That was it, that's all she needed to get a child. There was no background check, there was nothing done, there was no plan put in place on how to care for this child or how to reintegrate the parent into this child's life safely once they were released from prison. So in 2013, the lawsuit that her father brought against these agencies, along with the hospital where Erica was born, was finally settled. And basically outside of compensation, they made changes to their policies. They put a new set of rules in place and it was collectively called Erica's Rule, which required them to put a safe plan in place for the care of these children and to make sure that they are accounted for and taken care of. Is that so hard to do? Is that too much to ask to make sure that our babies are taken care of? Thank God they agreed and they put Erica's rules in place. Whew. But yeah, guys, that is the unfortunate story of Precious Doe, who was later identified as Erica Green. This poor baby, everything failed her. Her parents failed her. The system failed her everything failed her and this has to stop happening we have to make a change we have to do better for our babies i was so heartbroken by this story i just had to share it because it's very real and these things still happen in a lot of places today there's a lot of kids who go back to their drug addicted parents their criminal parents and they shouldn't be it shouldn't be happening. Someone has to care. These kids have to matter to someone. And thank God that her father got his life together and actually turned this case around to actually do some good for these children and his community and the people that are less important in this world. Less important. I am so happy that he pushed and he pushed until a change was made because that is the only way we're gonna get change. Somebody has to push. Somebody has to put their foot on somebody's necks to get something done. But that is the story of Erica Green. I really hope that you guys got something out of this story. Again, this really touched me when I came across the story, so I wanted to share it with you all. Let me know if you've heard of this story before and your thoughts on it in those comments down below. Also, if you have not subscribed yet, make sure that you're subscribed. You don't wanna miss out on everything that I have coming to you guys in the future. Also, make sure you like the video. It really helps my channel and it really lets me know that you enjoy what I am doing, what I am putting out to you guys. It's been a real one this week with this story, y'all. But until next time, love you guys. Bye.